there's a fair bit of praise and criticism tossed in the direction of Fallout 4. It's a collection of positively received features and negatively received creative decisions. Even with me, there's a lot of things I love and a lot of things that I take issue with. In the middle of these mixed opinions are some designs that are just baffling. Let's talk about Fallout 4's half-baked ideas. The introduction of Fallout 4 is perhaps the most unique in the franchise from the sheer basis of it being pre-war. Still, it doesn't really have much of a reason to exist beyond being slightly interesting on paper. There have been reports of Tuttleton wanting to feature the pre-war world for a while, which should be pretty evident with the simulations of Fallout 3. And to his credit, he got it into a game. But the extent we actually do explore the pre-war world is the sole survivor's house and a sliver of the neighborhood they live in before running to the vault. That's really it. It doesn't add much value to the player character, the narrative, or the player's understanding of pre-war life. For the first two, the whole reason the Institute kidnaps Sean and has a backup in the form of the sole survivor really comes down to unmutated DNA. It's basically the same reason the unity of Fallout 1 needed prime normals. The pre-war human aspect is not important just the untampered genetics. In theory, any vault that has yet to be opened is an option. Why make it a vault of pre-war Freezy Pops when another 13 would do just fine? There is one important caveat. The cryogenic freezing is perhaps more necessary to set up the big reveal that Sean is father. Yes, it's likely a pretty predictable twist and I don't think there was a ton of care for it either. Still, in world, that's a pretty big deal. To have the same moment would require a lot more convolution. The reality is the pre-war aspect isn't to the benefit of anything other than an excuse to set up the freezing aspect and making the sole survivor unsure how much time has passed after Kellogg snatched Sean away. That said, I do want to clarify. I'm not claiming they shouldn't have gone through with a pre-war life scenario. Quite the opposite. The pre-war protagonist is fine. Encouraged even. It's just that as it currently stands, it isn't particularly meaningful for the player. It certainly does not enhance the player's understanding of the pre-war world. And that's actually the much larger problem. Let's take a look at pre-war life. There was a resource war, food riots, and strict government and military action on the local population. In short, it sucked. Hard. Yet, Fallout 4 opens with this pretty idyllic life, doesn't it? A well-to-do, happily married couple with a newborn son in a home they own with a freshly purchased robotic butler. They're separated from this apparent hardship we barely even hear about. It paints such a stark contrast. But this is one of those cases where it's more about the execution than the idea. The idea itself isn't so bad. An upper middle class family composed of a veteran and a lawyer having it a bit easier is a decent narrative device. But we don't explore that darker side of pre-war life. Imagine Nate or Nora going off to buy some groceries and coming across a protest at a government annex store that's being held in lockdown by the military. They're only allowing access to a select few individuals, and the sole survivor's family is among those selected. The second the sole survivor passes the gate, a riot breaks out, and the heavily armed forces gun them down without mercy. Perhaps in the store, there's a fight that breaks out amongst the veterans to grab the remaining bit of groceries available. While all veterans would be allowed, they may not be as well off as the player's family. And like a Black Friday sale, things can get a little crazy. This fight would be a great time for some tutorial and combat mechanics. These two moments would allow us to explore some of the pre-war life, not just Nate and Nora's house. And this contrast between the player's family and everybody else would highlight how desperate things are for normal folks and even some protected families. As it stands, there's really no point in it. We make our character slowly walk around the nice clean home, hear the lovey-dovey banter, answer the door, dump our stats, slowly walk around again before hearing the news and running to the vault. Why not do a little more? A lot of people love settlement building and I'll admit it's a fun mechanic but I do not entirely understand the purpose it adds to the environment of the Commonwealth and the overall world building from a purely practical side. I do get the colony formation idea that's overall connected to the Minutemen in such apparent means. There's obviously a lot of historical importance of Boston ranging from the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, and the real life battle of Bunker Hill, which took place during the Siege of Boston. 
so its tones are extremely obvious as a motif that ties settlers to colonists. While flavoring the system's most connected faction, the Minutemen, in colonial garb, right down to the laser muskets. But it seems more like an excuse to have such elements rather than them feeling important on their own. More to the point, it doesn't really offer much. Many feel that the mechanic came at the cost of actual NPC towns. Whether that's true or not isn't actually confirmed. However, the game does allow the sole survivor to build over 30 settlements across the Commonwealth, compared to the two relatively close towns of Diamond City and Good Neighbor. Which is a bit of a problem. The game essentially tells you that in 200 or so years after the war, there was only one town that actually formed until a century and a half passed and then Good Neighbor appeared. That said, there was Quincy, a town sacked by the gunners. But we don't know when that town was set up, only that it was taken over very recently. Given that Piper was able to make a fabrication about the sole survivor being a traitor from Quincy, we could at least assume that lasted long enough to become recognized for some level of commerce. So depending on the timetable, maybe Quincy was the only second viable option up until Good Neighbor came around? Still, this all hits as a suspension of disbelief, especially given that the Commonwealth, for all its distrust and intrigue by the Institute, is a lot better off than the Capital Wasteland, which featured Megaton, Rivet City, Arafu, Canterbury Comets, and hell, even Lil Lamplight and Big Town. And freaking Big Town was constantly pillaged by super mutants. If the Institute was more overt in their efforts, actively and blatantly destroying settlements or rendering towns inhospitable, most importantly, in front of the player's eyes a la the Legion and Nipton, then yeah, I could see it. But now, not really. I'm aware they stopped the Commonwealth Provisional Government, but that's not really poisoning the well and salting the earth. The game tells you that only the sole survivor was capable of setting up towns in the Commonwealth, not 200 years of their own history. Even without the difficulty to suspend disbelief, the system doesn't add a ton to the game. It's fun, yes, it's a creative outlet for many. That said, it exists to exist, not really enhance the player's overall ability to handle the main quest. The biggest boon is the home base the player is likely to create, a place to store their hoarded items, showcase their trophies, and decorate their pad to their exact taste. And there is perhaps a benefit to getting shop merchants at a super easily accessible location or gaining a steady supply of adhesive to make upgrades and repairs. Though, to be fair, many would attest that survival mode is where settlements really shine. Overall, however, settlements exist to make settlements which for the most part is just a place for NPCs to walk around, perform a few animations, and occasionally come under attack. It's more of an art piece and less so useful. I talked a fair bit about my disappointment in the Gunners before, as well as the Talon Company, but it's a half-baked idea, so why not reiterate? The Gunners and Concept had a lot of potential a mercenary faction that's extremely well armed, at least compared to most groups. A clan that works for money, anything and everything for caps. However, the end result, as stated in this video, is little more than raiders with some mild replaceable importance to McCready and Preston. They don't really add much beyond being a handful of moments where in notes, you learn that they were doing a task or setting up shop somewhere. Honestly, they're kind of jobbers to larger threats. A way to tell the player that they're gonna run into some bad mojo between death claws, coursers, or even mind altering gases. But that's the only importance they actually serve. A more useful setup would be making these guys a great side questing group. Not the main quest, they don't care about the Institute, or maybe the Institute's are clients, and they're not gonna take out a payee. They do escort jobs, assassinations, raiding, package delivery, guard duty, in theory, an excellent faction to join if you want that cash flow. There's a lot of named characters in the Gunners that do not have a ton of importance, so giving them a few side quests would be pretty nice. They could give you access to a lot of good stuff that's a step below the Brotherhood in terms of quality. Come to think of it, such a group would have been great for Radiant Questing. Rather than a settlement being perpetually under attack, getting assignments from the Gunner Mission Command would be more realistic. Now, if only they had a better name than you know. Gunners. It's kinda lame. These are just some of the bigger problems I have with Fallout 4 and it's rather underutilized or pointless ideas. There's more I could talk about, such as the existence of Raider Power Armor that's already weaker than the set of T-45 that you're given not even 15 minutes into the game. Why shouldn't the Raider Armor be the starting Power Armor most acquire when it's Raiders that we're fighting to begin with? You find a Raider doing some mild repairs on his Power Arm, take him out and steal it. There you go. I mentioned the name, though still very generic, Gunner characters. 
they served little else than to be mini bosses. But there were others in different factions like raiders or super mutants. Why not give these guys a little more substance? At least Fist had something going for him. Speaking of which, there's also the Super Mutants entirely, but I recently did a video where I spent a good bit of time breaking the Fallout 4 interpretation of the Coles. Overall, I feel Fallout 4 is a mashup of underutilized or half-baked ideas that makes me go, what's the point? Again, that's not to say I necessarily find Fallout 4 to be a bad game, but it has a few good ideas that I feel hides its potential. Of course, this hasn't even gotten to a lot of people's issues with the Institute as a whole centerpiece of Force antagonistic group, though I could make a whole other video discussing this sense. I don't know why these half-baked ideas are so prevalent. Are they afraid to commit? Do they just not get enough dev time? Does Bethesda not have enough manpower? Or do they just aim far too big and hit too little? Regardless, I think a fair bit of these ideas could have spent more time in the oven. A very special thanks to my channel members, especially the members thrice over members like that crazy game developer and Denny McPhee. If you wish to support me and join us well, I'd be more than happy. Otherwise, like, share, subscribe, all that typical YouTube stuff. Thank you. Have a good one.